up through. Yeah, really. Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, originating from Westminster Presbyterian Church here in downtown Minneapolis. I am Donald Meisel, minister with my colleagues to and with this Center City congregation. We throw open the doors of this large semicircular sanctuary and fill it or nearly fill it six times a year of a Thursday noon and offer these issue-related forums to you, the public, the only charge being your high level of interest. Voices of conscience, key issues in ethical perspective. That's the rubric that has animated this series for six long, short years. Last month, The Voice, was that of the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, Harold Wilson. Today, the voice is that of Bob Keeshan, or Captain Kangaroo. Unusual company, strange bedfellows, you say. Not really. Each is concerned about people, about the world we live in, and about the kind of future the children of this age will inherit. Thirty years ago this month, Bob Keeshan created Captain Kangaroo. It's kind of a birthday party, perhaps. The longest-running children's program on network television. The show has won six Emmy Awards, and Keeshan was named Broadcaster of the Year by the International Radio and Television Society in 1979. In the course of those 30 years, Captain Kangaroo Mr. Green Jeans, Bunny Rabbit, Mr. Moose, Grandfather Clock, and Dancing Bear, among others, became breakfast companions to more than a generation of children. Many of you were there. Last Tuesday morning at a meeting here at Westminster, we spoke of Bob Keeshan's coming today. The whole room broke into a wide smile. That's what happens when this man is mentioned or walks into a room. Well, he just walked into this room, and we're smiling in anticipation, knowing at the same time that he might have some things to say that will make us cry. Mr. Keeshan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don, for that very, very generous introduction. In speaking on college campuses, uh, it is usually about this time that I hear a murmur in the audience, and it was only after many years' experience listening to that murmur that I uh, found out what was going on. It's at this point that usually it is said, it's him, it's him, I can tell by the voice. <laughs> it's a voice that uh, many of you did experience in your youth, and I hope that uh, you will find it uh, as of good counsel, as of uh, the same good counsel today as it was in those early days. That introduction was extremely generous, Don. I thank you. It made up for something that happened to me last week. I was speaking to a group after dinner. The waiters were serving coffee, and as we were running late, as those things often do, and the master of ceremonies sitting next to me turned to me and he said, Shall I introduce you now, Bob, or shall we let them enjoy themselves a little longer? <laughs> I hope he didn't mean that. 
I'm just delighted to be with you this afternoon in the heartland of this great nation to speak to you about young people and all the influences upon them in contemporary society that will determine the sort of adults they will grow to be and the kind of society we will build for ourselves in the near future. Some of you who do not have direct responsibility for children may wonder what all this talk about young people has to do with your life, your happiness, and your future. I suggest that each of us in America today, whether we have anything to do with children or not, is directly affected by how we treat children. And indeed, we are all living a lifestyle shaped to a great extent by the way we treated children in this nation over the last 20 years. I hope at the conclusion of my remarks you will understand the importance to you and to your future of the American system of nurturing its young people for better or for worse. Now most people expect me to talk about television and its effects on children, properly so, because television is the environment in which I have dwelt for over a third of a century in my work with young people. It is, however, quite impossible to speak of television and children without addressing the many other influences affecting the young. Children, you see, do not exist in a television vacuum. And as simple as it would be to assign the responsibility for the woes of children to television, that would be another one of those simplistic answers to complex questions of which Americans seem so fond. Whatever role television plays in affecting children, for good or bad, I suggest that the medium is but a small component in the nurturing system in place in today's America. Nonetheless, one of the most often discussed issues these days is concern for the effects of television viewing on our young people. Television has been a fixture in American homes for many years. Most of you listening to me now never knew a world without television. When two or more people come together to discuss questions of children and television, often much heat is generated, and occasionally some little light shines through the smoke and something is learned. Now I ask your indulgence if I adopt a somewhat avuncular perspective toward these issues because unlike most of you, I did not grow up with television. I assisted with the birthing when the infant a tiny blue-lighted screen was screaming its immature programs to a nation that was listening to radio. And like most infants, television was awake only a few hours each day, usually from 8 to 10 p.m. Two hours was a lot of programming to come up with every day. I am in my 38th year as a television actor and producer. I have done somewhere in the neighborhood of 12,000 programs, a rather crowded neighborhood. But in the beginning, in the beginning was the word, and the word was radio. In 1947, there were less than 80,000 television sets in the entire nation, and many of those were mounted above the bottles of alcohol in saloons and bar rooms. The NBC television network, a struggling subsidiary of the far more prosperous radio company, was about to expand its eastern network by adding Syracuse to Philadelphia and New York. At about this time, I was working my way through college as an NBC page when a genial early morning radio host named Bob Smith asked me to help with a soon-to-air television program for children, Howdy Doody. I was willing. I was not only willing, as a matter of fact, I was eager. You see, I needed the money to supplement my GI Bill benefits. So I donned a clown suit, honked a horn, squirted a seltzer bottle, and 30 years later became a question in a board game trivial pursuit. <laughs> so perhaps this Saturday evening, some of you will win that very game as a result of this knowledge I have given you. At the tender age of 19, I had no credentials for programming for young people, no background in child psychology, no understanding of the needs of children. That came later, after years of experience and study, and to no small extent as a parent to my own children. In those beginning days, I was, quite simply, earning money to make my way to law school. In those early days, we were struggling to make sense out of the tools that television had given us with very little opportunity to rely on precedent. Television was visual, like the movies, but it was so intimate. 
The experience for a child watching a program in her living room was a very different experience from watching the Saturday morning movie serials, Tom Mix and Rin Tin Tin and the like, in the local theater, surrounded by a thousand screaming and cheering peers. Television had advantages over radio, but also suffered in some ways by comparison. I lamented then, as I do now, television's inability to make demands on the imagination of the viewer. I remember the radio of my youth, Let's Pretend, and Irene Wicker, the story lady, Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy from Hudson High. If there were two million listeners, there were two million images of Jack Armstrong and two million images of Hudson High. You see, radio called upon us to conjure up images. Little Orphan Annie was popular in radio. I wore her ring, her decoder ring. I wore it right here on this finger, the one that is still green from her gold ring. <laughs> we all knew what Little Orphan Annie looked like from, because she was, of course, a character in the comic strips. One of the burning questions of my childhood was, why don't they allow Little Orphan Annie to grow up? The question is answered for me today every time I see the actress who originally played Annie on Broadway, Andrea McArdle. Andrea did grow up, and the grown-up Andrea is an entirely different character from the Annie of my youth. In early television, we had the Small Fry Club with Bob Emery and Lucky Pup with his mentor, the great Fudini. It was the one-two punch of Howdy Doody and Uncle Milty, which brought television out of the bar room and into the living room. Later, after Clarabelle, Mr. Bluster, the lovely Princess Summerfall, Winter Spring, came Paul Tripp and Mr. Imagination and Rudy Kazuti and a young man named Walter Cronkite with the family appeal of, you are there. On October 3rd in 1955, there appeared two new programs for children, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. The morning brought an old man jingling some keys and opening the doors to his treasure house, Captain Kangaroo. That very afternoon, there appeared for the first time some kids with song and dance and funny ears, the Mouseketeers and the Mickey Mouse Club. That very evening, for the first time on television, we saw some radio favorites making the transition to the still new medium. It was a modest little western with characters named Doc and Kitty and the Marshal himself. Gunsmoke. If you had to pick a debut date, October 3rd, 1955 was not a bad day. Many people look back and refer to those as the golden days, and they were fun days. The economic pressures were not as great. We didn't arrive at work each morning, heart in mouth, waiting to hear the overnights, the audience ratings. We made mistakes and kidded about them because we were allowed mistakes. It was technologically the nature of the young beast. But the days were not all that golden. Writers had to write to accommodate camera moves and costume changes. The number of cream pies that missed Uncle Milty will never be counted. Nor will we count the scenes that will never be reshot. My friend Dick Clark would have been hard put to come up with more bloopers. All America saw our bloopers on live television. We had some of the finest writers ever to come to the craft in those days, and the production and direction was first rate within the confines of live television production. The acting was very good, but often suffered in extenuating circumstances. I shall never forget the scene in a live production of Arsenic and Old Lace when a window seat was opened to reveal the body. The investigator said with great seriousness, dead over an extreme close shot of an actor placed in the dark interior 20 minutes earlier, suddenly exposed to the hundreds of bright lights of early television, eyes blinking, blinking, <laughs> blinking, <coughs> through a very, very slow fade. It was not a convincing performance, but a very human one from the golden days. My friends, the golden days of television and many other halcyon days are gone. Television programming was born when Harry Truman was president. President Truman had a custom of walking the streets of Washington and New York and Kansas City, followed by reporters and friendly citizens. Hi, Mr. President. Hi, Harry. Give him hell, Harry. Now, we don't allow our presidents to walk the streets like that today. We cannot. 
Automobiles of those days sported huge fins in the rear, and they traveled all of 8 to 12 miles on a gallon of gasoline. They were not as plentiful as today. One reason they were not as plentiful is because we lacked the road system of today. That all began in the 50s with President Eisenhower and the paving of America. Along with those roads came the shopping center, the fast food industry, and the devise of many urban centers. Now, the American family leaves the dining room round table and travels to a dinner of Macs and Whoppers and fries. Good food, so nutritionists tell me, but the opportunity for family conversation is limited. In the 50s, it required almost a day's investment of your time to fly from New York to Los Angeles. Commercial jet airplanes were creatures of the 60s. Now, most of us fly casually great distances. Many of us are miles from the place of our birth, our roots in a new soil, and mother, grandmother, is the voice on long distance. Reach out, reach out, and touch her. Have you picked a long distance phone service yet? <laughs> MCI, Sprint, at and please don't ask me which one to pick. I don't know, such decisions are beyond me. I do know that grandmother on long distance is no substitute for the real thing, and kids are the big losers there. The world is different from the pre-television world, and we're faced with family and nurturing problems today that we could hardly conjure up a third of a century ago. Solving complex problems seems more difficult each day. We're all familiar with that wonderful work by L. Frank Baum, The Wizard of Oz, a great work with characters so much like the people we meet in our real lives. The cowardly lion, the tin woodman, the scarecrow, the Land of Oz, Dorothy and Toto, Munchkins, Quadlings, and Wicked Witches. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could solve all of the problems we face in an allegorical manner? We could cause a Kansas farmhouse to fall upon the Wicked Witch of the East. Problem solved. We could, with a dash of cold water, solve the problem of the Wicked Witch of the West. We could call upon the winged monkeys to carry us to the Emerald City, sometimes referred to as St. Paul, other times known as Washington, <laughs> where we would meet the frightening Oz and find him to be a good man, if a terrible wizard. No, we all come to learn that problems are not so easily solved, so simply solved. They don't melt in front of our eyes. And there are no wizards in St. Paul or Washington, regardless of what their press secretaries will tell you. <laughs> Interestingly, some of the most significant clues to the state of our American nurturing system can be found not on the general news pages of our newspapers, but in the financial section. I was reading a story in the New York Times recently about the Pritzker family of Chicago, McCall's Magazine, Braniff Airlines, and Hyatt Hotels. The family patriarch, A.N. Pritzker, was reported to be excited about a logical area of development. My mission is to build jails, said A.N. A partner has developed a process for modular prisons. Not a bad idea, this business of building prisons. Mr. Pritzker makes the case very well. In the hotel business, he says, we're happy if we're 80% rented. In the jail business, they have 200% occupancy. <laughs> Mr. Pritzker is right. The jail business is a very good business in the United States today. Recently, the CBS television magazine, 60 Minutes, Morley Safer did a story on private enterprise in the business of financing, building, and operating detention centers. Some of the corporate names in American jail building are the Corrections Corporation of America, RCA, and E.F. Hutton. Last month, the Corrections Corporation of America proposed that it operate all the jails in the state of Tennessee. The governor of that state is weighing the offer. Mr. Safer commented on 60 Minutes, the jail business is an American growth industry. Now why? Why am I so interested in the jail business? Because, my friends, I believe that there is a very direct connection between the jail business and the business that we are addressing today, the nurturing of young people. In mid-September, it was reported that the federal and state prison population in this nation had increased by 5.5% in the first six months of 1985. 5.5% in only six months. 
Talk about inflation. We now have over a half million people in federal and state prisons, more in local institutions. Many of these prisoners are the children we started to nurture in the mid-60s. Where did we go wrong? Oh, yes, yes, I believe that society provides the environment and shapes its young for better or worse. Criminals are not made in some other world, carefully shaped by the angels of Lucifer. Criminals are made right here on earth in our own society, in our homes, in our schools, in our beloved communities. We chose in the 60s and the 70s to tolerate poverty and other deprivation, to save money. And now we are paying for those economies in today's dollars, to say nothing of the social cost. He was hungry and we failed to feed him. He was sick and he found no cure from us. He was in need of counseling and direction, but we saved on that expense also. Now we taxpayers will spend $20,000 or more add on for inflation every year for years to come to keep him behind bars and us out of harm's way. Penny wise and pound foolish. A.N. Pritzker is quite right. The jail business represents a fine American business opportunity. If we are to avoid repeating our mistakes, if we're to halt the progress of prison building as an American growth industry, we are urgently in need of one thing in America today, commitment. We need the commitment of society, all of society, to America's young people. Children in America today need friends. They need friends in powerful places, in the legislature, at City Hall. They need friends at home, in school, at church, and on the playing fields. It will be in these places that tomorrow's battle shall be won and today's children shaped into tomorrow's well-functioning, happy adults. We, who have escaped the rigors of childhood, need young people to have friends, if only in our own self-interest. Now, if your childhood memories are only a blissful moment, you're fortunate. But if you are like most of us, your memories of childhood are a mixture of the bitter with the sweet. Despite persistent myths, growing up, maturing, is not an easy process. And there are many child professionals in our nation who think that today, growing up, may be a more difficult process than ever, with ominous implications for the future of our society. Society has changed radically in the last 30 years, and our ways of nurturing children have changed also. The changes in lifestyle brought about by the development of the modern American automobile, the road system threading together shopping centers, fast food emporiums and amusement parks, jet planes, fast travel, and the diminishing value assigned to roots and family tradition, and television. Now, television has been in American homes for over a third of a century, but there is little agreement on how it has affected our society. Many people who look at television and its use by children address the question as a problem and only as a question of broadcaster responsibility. Now, this view ignores the real world where television is used by most American parents as a babysitter. Result? Over 90% of juvenile viewing in the United States is not children's programming, specifically produced for a young audience, but adult programming, soap operas, game shows, primetime violence. One such program with the second largest juvenile audience in America today is called The A-Team. Surely we're not going to suggest that adult audiences for whom the soaps, game shows, and primetime thrillers are intended be deprived of these shows because parents will not control television viewing by their children. You see, it is a difficult and time-consuming thing, this being a parent. Certainly broadcasters do have a responsibility to provide better programming for young people. If they are good citizens, broadcasters and the advertising community, their source of funding, will recognize the needs of young Americans and will move to meet those needs. The future of the nation will be enhanced by their positive contribution to the nurturing of young Americans. This philosophy has been made more difficult by recent government actions which have relieved broadcasters of accountability for the way they serve special audiences. The chairman of the Federal Communications Commission has expressed his position by stating that the marketplace will take care of children. 
I know how that works in practice. The captain in his morning position on CBS had very good audiences. In fact, the morning news, which replaced the captain, has a smaller audience. However, the captain's audience was made up of children and a large group of mothers. The morning news has an adult audience, a smaller but all adult audience. The marketplace won out. A more economically attractive audience, adults, though smaller in size, brings more dollars to the bottom line. So much for the marketplace philosophy serving young America. Then there is public television working furiously to meet special audience needs. But poorer than the proverbial church mouse, pardon the expression in the sanctuary. <laughs> Anyone here for Pledge Week? Public television wants to make a home for the captain, and we want to move in. They can't pay the very modest costs completely, so we're turning to corporate America and asking for very modest underwriting. It's not easy. Despite the rhetoric of America, we love children. They are our future. Most companies want to know how their underwriting can benefit the stockholders. Not all feel that way, of course. We have about two-thirds of our funding in place, and if we can find corporate good citizens to come up with a few hundred thousand in additional funding, public television will bring the captain to contemporary children five days a week. Of course, I happen to believe that such underwriting does benefit the stockholders far beyond the social good it can mean to American families. The reservoir of good feeling for the captain on the part of those who grew up with him, those between 10 and 35 years of age, is simply incredible. These people, my yupparoos as I call them, <laughs> My yupparoos will shower their appreciation and patronage on the companies responsible for bringing the captain to their children. The underwriting, my friends, is good business as well as a very nice thing to do for American families. When we talk about nurturing in America today, we are often tempted to look back on those good old days to talk about the golden age. Now, I'm not certain if there ever was a golden age for the American family. Nice mommy, nice daddy, and uh, relative affluence, tender loving care for happy children. Our memories are often perfumed with a sweetness that covers the reality of another age, but there are some notice noticeable differences. We have more single parent families than ever before. 20% of American children, over 12 million, live in single parent households. In all households, we have many more working mothers. In 1947, only 18% of mothers worked outside the home. Today, almost two thirds of mothers are in the outside of the home workforce. It makes one wonder about our society's priorities, that at a time when we have more latchkey children than in Dickensian and London, we choose to curtail programs for the daycare of our young people. With all this blessed technology, we have not eradicated poverty in the nation. 20% of American children live in poverty. That means living on a 1982 family of four income of $9,862 or less. 13 million American children live in such circumstances. Although 20% of American children are living in poverty, they comprise a far higher percentage of the poor in this nation. 39% of America's poor are children, 39%. That means that almost four out of every 10 Americans living in poverty are children. Shame on us. Several decades ago, we began a war on poverty of the aged with great success, a great achievement. Now in America, the young appear among the poor more than twice as often as the aged. The young are our future. We are a nation that worries about its health, and yet we suffer the improperly diagnosed and inadequately treated handicapped child. Forty percent of our preschoolers are not properly immunized against all the diseases of childhood. Many of our children in this land of fruited plain and excess grain go to bed hungry. Many more go to bed ill-nourished. Many go to bed in detention centers and jails. Does anyone really care about malnutrition and starvation in the United States and throughout the world? 
I have a small garden beside my home, which I tend with pride. It's small, but the fruits are sweet to me and to my family. How does an American farmer feel when he knows that so much of the fruits of his labor will not reach hungry mouths? Now, I am told that I am politically and economically naive to expect the labor of the American farmer to be matched with the needs of the hungry. My friends, if you believe in God, you must wonder how he feels about our stewardship. If you believe in science, you must wonder what dunces we are in this nation so boastful of its technology. If you believe in nothing, perhaps you understand this world better than most. At the end of the motion picture, The Bridge on the River Kwai, the British medical officer stands high above the river, surveying the fallen bridge, the death, the destruction, amid the incredible beauty of nature. He speaks the final words of the movie, words that I feel are often appropriate to our world. Madness. 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 America loves children. Ask any American, he will tell you, we are a nation committed to the family. But all is not right with the American family. Why else do we have two million kids running away from home each year? Two million. They're not running away to join the circus or to become riverboat pilots on the Mississippi. They're running from a life they must change. They may be children who are beaten sexually abused, or children not with broken bones but broken hearts, the victims of psychological abuse. They don't travel first class. They leave home without their American Express card. They usually travel in the back of the bus to the nearest city of lights. They're starry-eyed. They're soon befriended by a spotter who offers them aid and assistance. He's so friendly, and friendship has been a rare commodity in their lives. If the runaway is a female, perhaps 14 or 15 years of age, he will offer her a cup of coffee in the coffee shop, a powder in with the sugar, a trip to his sister's apartment to sleep it off, a week of sexual abuse, and she's consumed with self-hate. She's soon on the streets, the latest in a pimp's stable of hookers. Bruce Ritter <clears throat> is a Catholic priest who runs a home for runaways in New York and other places. Bruce and his staff of professionals do what they can to help these runaway kids, but he knows what the usual response will be when he picks up the phone to reach out to some parent. Keep her. We don't want her. Send her back and we'll have her arrested. Most of these kids should not be called runaways. They're really throwaways, discarded by their parents and failed by society. I'm a director of the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse. We're pleased that the subject of abuse of children is receiving so much attention from the media. Most of the attention, of course, concerns sexual abuse of children, and there is so much such abuse in child care centers, in schools, and certainly in the warmth and comfort of our homes. I'm happy that such acts are receiving so much attention, but we should also know that there are many other forms of child abuse, more common, more numerous forms of abuse. The physical, non-sexual abuse of children is quite common, just a little discipline, the beating of a child into submission, the breaking of a child's will. This type of abuse is even recommended by some prominent churchmen. An Indiana moral majority leader was successful in a campaign to weaken that state's child abuse laws in 1981. He defends his actions on the grounds that, quote, the Bible instructs parents to whip their children with a rod. Welts and bruises are a sign that a parent is doing a good job of discipline, unquote. An even more common form of abuse may be psychological abuse where no bones are broken, no bruises raised, but where a child's self-esteem after years of denigration is so low that accomplishment is impossible. You dumb kid, don't touch that. You'll only break it. You can't do anything right. Remember, many psychologists believe that high self-esteem is a key ingredient for accomplishment. Parents should be concerned, as should all of society, that today's children may not have a childhood to look back upon. If the Grinch stole Christmas, someone is stealing childhood. 
This larceny is the subject of two recent books, Neil Postman's The Disappearance of Childhood and David Elkin's The Hurried Child. Dr. Elkin comments, the children of the 80s are growing up too fast, too soon. They are being pressured to take on the physical, emotional, and social trappings of adulthood before they're capable of dealing with them. In today's America, the pressure to compete is intense. A child is born, and his uncle is already talking about Harvard. There is the ever-present fear of failure from preschool days on. A late bloomer, a child is a late bloomer, unable to read well at seven. And he comments, I guess I'm a flop in life. We pressure children to succeed. Hurry, hurry, succeed, is the message. Abandon our ship, the SS childhood, over the side and into the sea of life. Forget about Santa Claus and make believe. Abandon imagination and get on with the business of real life. Dr. Elkin says many adolescents feel betrayed by a society that tells them to grow up too fast, but also to remain a child. This contradiction, he believes, has much to do with drug abuse and alcoholism among teenagers. Oh, I remember quite vividly, my friends, the proud day when I showed up for the first day of seventh grade in my first pair of long trousers. You see, I was nurtured in the knickers generation when it was quite all right to take some time to enjoy childhood, unashamedly to believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, to revel in the warm sunshine of a summer's day. Today's summers may be spent sharpening athletic skills, cramming math, or mastering the computer. And knickers? Well, you can forget about them. No self-respecting child today is without jeans. Designer jeans with someone else's name on the back pocket. And according to the television commercials, you better watch the way you walk in those jeans. America is watching your derriere, or so Calvin will tell us. The fun, my friends, has gone out of childhood for the hurried generation, and by rushing our children into adulthood, we're placing the future in jeopardy. Technology, despite its great promises, many of them delivered to today's children, can also constitute an awesome threat to our young people. My preteen years, those years of doubt and wonder, were spent in the 1930s, a time of turmoil in some parts of the world, but the commotion was hardly felt on the green lawns and sandy beaches of my childhood. I felt the warmth of parental love. I loved my siblings, had good friends and good times. I knew I had a future. It never occurred to me that I might not. I entered my teens in June of 1940. The once far off storm was no longer so far away. I remember much of how I viewed myself and the future in those years from 1940 to 1945, from 13 to 18 years of age. I remember not feeling very confident in the future. I was finishing high school, but with the knowledge that I would soon be going not to college, but to sandy beaches very different from those of my childhood. It affected my grades. It was not easy to concentrate when you knew you would soon be a character in the newsreel at the local movie house. It was a difficult time to grow up. How must it be for today's children living with the threat of nuclear holocaust? Do they fear for their future? Will an appreciable number of this generation feel powerless, frustrated, and hopeless about their future? Many psychologists tell us that young children especially should be reassured. If my children were young today, I would not know how to do that. I never lied to them, and I'm very frightened about the possibilities. Certainly silence is not the answer. We should talk with our children about the threat of nuclear war. Some researchers say that is one of the problems in parent-child relationships today, the inability of parents to talk about the nuclear threat. Parents don't talk about sex and they don't talk about bombs. What is a kid going to do? The results can be devastating. Society ought to be aware that the sword of nuclear threat may hang on a thinner thread for young people than for adults. The great psychological effects that this threat may have on some children and the small effects on most children ought to be in our collective societal mind as the generation matures. We can remind our political leaders that all of us in society, young and old, need to have this great burden lifted from us. We can also try to reassure our older children by reminding them that the word holocaust has roots in the ancient Greek. It's not much consolation, but man has lived with fire a very long time. 
Man has also lived with drugs and alcohol a very long time, but now is abusing these substances as never before. Some experts believe the insecurity fostered by nuclear threat has contributed to the devaluation of life by drug and alcohol users. If there is no future, what the heck? Most of users suffer very low self-esteem, back to psychological self-abuse, child abuse. Why in this advanced nation, in this modern age, are we unable to control the poisonous growing import and control and import of drugs? If we defended as vigorously against drugs as we defend against missiles, we could save millions of American lives. We could save other lives around the world by eliminating an important source of income for terrorists. Lives in Near Eastern mosques, on Italian cruise ships, lives snuffed out daily on the American continents. Profits from the drug trade nurture terrorist activities. The growing shipping, selling, and using of illicit drugs is a heinous act against the soul of mankind, an act of destruction felt in every corner of the earth by innocent people. Please do not tell me about victimless crime. Each purchase, every use, causes misery to many other human beings. Let us stop it. If we all think about it. If we all think about children, about how our actions in government, in business, in industry, in the professions, in the academy affect them, if we can talk to our children, act as if we really care, then we can change things for young people. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the many problems facing our nation today in nurturing its children are easily solved. There are no easy answers despite our national trait for seeking them. The French scholar Raymond Aron, shortly before his death, said, the American believes that when there's a problem, there's always a solution. The journalist H.L. Mencken put it another way. To every complex question, there is a simple answer, and it's wrong. But we do, my friends, we must start facing the problems in our nurturing system in an intelligent way. Perhaps a change in attitude would be a good beginning. The child psychiatrist Robert Coles, who teaches at Harvard, says, we may be a youth-oriented society, but we love youth, not children. I believe we have an urgent need to improve the fabric of life in this nation, to meet our people needs, particularly our young people needs. We have a need to reorder our priorities. Now understand me clearly, very clearly. I believe in a strong defense for this nation. We must defend against our enemies from without. But I also tell you that we must defend against our enemies from within. We must defend the nation against poverty and hunger, against ignorance and sloppiness, and low standards, against disease and drugs and disillusion, against despair. We must encourage every child to know his, to know her uniqueness, and to reach the fullness of human potential. The future of America is alive today, my friends. The future is alive today in the hearts, the minds, the souls, and yes, in the stomachs of today's young people. If we do not place love in those hearts, nurture those minds and souls, and feed those bodies, we may find ourselves a decade from now with a society not worth defending against the enemies from without. You will influence the course we take into moving into a new century Please dedicate some of your efforts to improving the lot of the young. And in so doing, you will enhance the future of this nation. As my parents planted for me, I plant for my children. The clock is running, rapidly approaching century 21. The psychologist Alberta Siegel says, we have 20 years to save civilization, the time it takes to raise a generation. My friends, let the next 20 years begin with you today. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Keeshan. You have traced the last 50 years with, uh, in a very engaging, if also disturbing manner. You've pointed up our foibles, you've challenged us, you've made us laugh, and as we guessed, you also made us cry. We take a moment now to remind our radio audience that they are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum originating from Westminster Presbyterian Church here in downtown Minneapolis. To remind also that the speaker of the day is Mr. Bob Keeshan, uh, known as Captain Kangaroo. He has engaged us and he is now willing to uh, respond to a few questions. Those of you who must leave uh, at this time are privileged to do so. It's also the time to uh, receive questions in the aisles. The ushers will pick them up. Thank you. One question. What was, sir, the most important thing you hoped children learned from watching your show? Well, I think that the most important thing that we attempted to convey to young people that they were unique, the uniqueness of each individual human being. There has never before in the history of the world been someone exactly like you. And that you have the opportunity and the obligation to develop that uniqueness and to, uh, to realize your full potential. And that you have in our society the opportunity to develop and to be able to do almost anything that you are driven, that you desire to do. And uh, if we could make children aware of their own value, this is the, probably the greatest quest of a child. Children change. How have children changed over the years? We see those changes. They have a greater uh, knowledge of the world around them, probably because of television viewing, uh, a greater vocabulary. But these are surfaces, uh, surface changes, a veneer. Uh, scratch away all of that and down deep the child is the same child as the child of 30 or 40 or 50 or perhaps 100 years ago. Who am I? Am I of value? Am I loved? It is the search for value that each human pursues in, in early years that is so important. And if we could in any way augment the efforts of the, of the home and other uh, agencies in the life of the child uh, to impress the child uh, with uh, his, with her uniqueness and her value, uh, and prepare that child uh, to, uh, to, for fulfillment, uh, then we succeeded in our mission. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this is a, perhaps you've already answered but what you've just said. How do we instill hope in our children in this nuclear age? Well, that implies more than, more than what I've said. How mm -hmm. do we imply hope in a nuclear age? That's difficult. I, I, I don't believe, as I said in my remarks, I don't believe in in uh, fantasizing and lying to children, <laughs> uh, euphemistically fantasizing, it comes down to lying when we, when we tell them that there are no problems. I think we do have to, uh, we have to have confidence in the future and, and we have to have confidence in our leaders and so much of what goes on in, in world diplomacy and that we read about in the newspapers is such nonsense. It's mm -hmm. so silly, it's not to our benefit, it's not to the benefit of, 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 of mankind and I wish all of this games playing that goes on would stop so that I wouldn't worry about it and you wouldn't worry about it and our children wouldn't worry about it. But there are insecurities in life and that's very important uh, for children to learn about. Uh, they have to learn that, there are, that this is not a perfect world, that, that we, the human condition uh, uh, does, uh, uh, does uh, show us many, uh, many of the human foibles and, and uh, we have to learn to live with those insecurities and I suppose that's important for a child to learn as, as anything else. Thank you. Uh, another comment from our audience, I want to thank you for being a very good and positive influence to my five children in their growing up years. Are you doing any writing for personal satisfaction or publication? Well, I'm spending my time doing a lot of things. I, I am doing writing. I'm not spending as much time on it as I'd like to. I, I, I really would like to write more. I, I have wonderful ideas for children's books and for adult books, uh, um, for, for adults and for parents in particular, adults in general, because I believe that all of us, as I said, in adult society have responsibility for children, not just parents alone. Um, I'm spending so much time doing television. As many of you know, I have a program for older children on Saturday morning, Story Break, which has to do with uh, the, in which we animate children's books, the best of children's literature, and I do a lot of home video and I do a lot of uh, lecturing and a lot of traveling. So in between all of that I am writing and I'm going to discipline myself, force myself to provide more time, uh, just to tear out pages of my calendar so I will give more time to it because it is something I think that I, I want to do a good deal more of. Thank you. 
Let's see. In determining what would be aired on your TV show, what guiding principles did you use? What helped you to say yay or nay to an idea? Well, it's probably best to uh, put this way. I suppose that the basic, um, uh, the basic ingredient in, in uh, our formula for uh, programming for young people could be called respect. I think that's probably what is most essential if you're going to do a quality program for young people. There are a lot of programs for young people you can do uh, without respect, but they won't be quality programs. If you respect the child and you're not exploiting the child and that you know that you have influence over the child and you wish to leave the child at the end of the program a little better than you found the child at the beginning of the program, do everything accordingly. It doesn't really matter what the subject matter, what the idea is, what, 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 the, what you're going to discuss that day, what, you're going to, what adventure you're going to take them on. Writers, producers, actors, directors, right down, I should say right down, right to the production assistant or the one who runs for coffee working on the children's show, should have one, one key ingredient in their makeup, respect for young people. If you don't respect young people, you can't do a quality program, and that's essential. What then is your opinion of current children's programming on TV, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, Saturday morning cartoons, and the like? Well, of course, Mr. Rogers is perhaps my patron saint. He and I are very good friends, uh, very close, and uh, we talk to each other a lot. We're separated by a few hundred miles, he in Pittsburgh and I in, in, in uh, New York and Connecticut. But we, we do speak to each other, uh, each other a lot. I think he's wonderful. A lot, of, a lot of adults have a problem with Mr. Rogers on occasion, you see, because he is so uh, perfect for children in that narrow age when they need that emotional underpinning that Fred Rogers gives them. And he's absolutely in perfect communication and perfect harmony with young people. I'm a great admirer of him. I like Sesame Street. They become much more humanistic uh, than they were in the beginning. They're paying much less attention to the Madison Avenue formulas that were successful in selling toys and toothpaste and decided to use in uh, selling uh, alphabet and, and, and mathematical skills. They're now learning that a child is not merely a computer but is a human being and that the emotional uh, side of the child must be uh, developed and catered to and considered, and uh, I, I'm very happy that they're doing more of that. I think most of the programming on public television is wonderful. They'd love to do more. The problem, of course, comes back to funding, which we spoke of before. Uh, Saturday morning, there are a few shows that are all right. I think Story Break is wonderful. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I guess the Smurfs are all right, you know, and a few others that, that kind of tickle me a little bit. But for the most part, those programs are not intended to entertain. They're intended to sell. They're, they're intended to exploit young people, and they're designed as a, as a medium uh, to, to sell, to gather a large audience, and therefore to sell young people. And that's too bad, because here we are 37 years after television first came into American homes, and we're talking about so many of the negative aspects of television, the bad things that it does. We're talking about uh, so many of the things that it doesn't do. We really should be talking about about, and we should be proud at this point, a third of a century later, about the wonderful way we use television. We're the only society in, in, in the Western world that doesn't use television well to culturally educate its young people. Uh, it happens in England, it happens in Italy, it happens in France, it happens in Germany, it happens in the Soviet Union. We may not agree with their philosophy, but they are very, very aware of the power of television. And here in our great, wonderful, free enterprise society, we let the marketplace control what we do on television, and we think that's to our credit. Well, we're destroying a generation of children, and certainly we're not enhancing a generation of children. We have the power, we have the tools, we have the capability to do that. That's what we should be talking about today. Thank you. How would you describe the unique spirit of America's children as compared to the spirit of the children of other nations? Or do all children share a sameness of spirit? If so, what is that spirit most characteristic of children as you understand it? Well, I think all children do come into this world uh, in very much the same condition. Uh, and and uh, from there on, it's, it's the environment that they experience that shapes them. And that's very much what I was talking about today. Mm -hmm. if, if a child comes into a home uh, where he or she is well appreciated and loved and wanted, and the parent is patient and is willing to sacrifice to give time. That's the one thing a child wants, is time. They don't want toys and, and uh, stereos and, uh, and designer clothes. Oh, they'll take them, but they don't really want them. What they really want is us. They want our time. They want our time when they want it, not when we're prepared to give it to them. We're tired. We're beaten down as we come home. And, and there is that child 
waiting thumb and mouth, doll in hand. Daddy, what do you hear what happened to me in the, in the sandbox today? Honey, I'm tired, please. Oh, what a day I've had at the factory. What a day I've had at the office. I'm busy, come on, let me rest. Go watch television later, and later never comes. So you see, the one thing we have to give them is our time. Now, I think a child in another society, in another part of the world, if given the benefit of that, uh, uh, that kind of a system where the home, the family is tight and good and, and pays attention to the child, and hopefully other conditions such as uh, uh, education and nutrition and, and medicine and so on, uh, all are positive, then the child will grow to be a positive human being. Uh, but in our society, as I mentioned, 20% uh, of our children live in poverty. That's staggering. Most of us in our affluent uh, world going about every day, uh, you know, flying around the country and then driving our nice automobiles and, and shopping at Christmas time in the shopping centers, we never think about those kids, but those kids are the future. 20% of Americans, our American children are living in poverty. Now, there's going to be a scar on those children, and those are the children that are going to meet us in a, in a park in the, on a dark night, and those are the children that are going to break into our homes, and, and, and if not that, those are the children, children that are going to be mentally ill and mentally incapable of becoming productive, happy taxpayers. And that's silly. I mean, if, if, you're, if, if you can't find the compassion to, to argue against that, at least find the good economic, the good common sense to be a sensible taxpayer and say, that's enough. I don't want to pay for prisons, I want to pay for childhood programs that will develop good, solid taxpayers. Would you comment on the Rambo phenomenon? <laughs> oh, I think I'd rather not. I, I don't think... Um, I don't think language like that is permitted on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, hear you. I, I just, I, you know, I don't know what to say. It's, a, it's really something that I, I fail to comprehend. I suppose there's something base in the human being that, that is appealed to in that, uh, the, the desire for violence. Uh, I just, uh, I hate to see violence exploited. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, I think Rambo is, it's just an exploitation of violence. You know, you can, you can, and, and I know that the producers have come forth with all kinds of psychological underpinning for, for their making the movie and the need for America to, uh, to, to experience vicariously this violence, and it's supposed to be a good thing for us. Uh, I, I don't believe a bit of it. I think it's just, I think it's just exploitation, and uh, we're all, as a nation, we're at, you know, violence is a terrible thing. We, we, we seem to have a, a terrible fear of sex in this country, and, uh, you know, if we're value givers, we should be concerned about sexual values and so on, but you know, I think we should be more frightened about violence. Uh, through television, through motion pictures, and through other, uh, other media, over the last third of a century, we as a nation, adults and children, have become immunized to violence. When I was a child, a murder occurred in a small community in which I grew up. I could not, I can remember today, how difficult it was for me to come to grips with the enormity of that act. As an eight-year-old child, I could not understand how someone could take a human life but I don't think you'd find any difficulty finding an eight-year-old, or you couldn't find anybody eight years old in this country today who'd have that kind of a problem, because we've become immunized. Just as we've become immunized to, to so many diseases, we, we've become immunized to violence. We're no longer shocked by violence, we accept it. And it is not, it is not a casual part of our lives. It cannot be a part of our lives if we are to survive as a society. Just a quickie and a light one. One of your trademarks is having hundreds and hundreds of ping pong balls dropped on your head. How did that begin? Well, I was going to bring Mr. Moose with me today to, uh, to exp have him explain why he dropped ping pong balls on me, but I don't know. Have you ever tried to get a moose on a Republic airline plane late night? It's, it's very difficult. You have to buy two seats, and even then they're a little touchy about it. Uh, those ping pong balls hurt. <laughs> uh, no, it was a wonderful thing. It happened, first of all, by accident. It became so popular that it was written into the program, and I guess it's now part of, uh, uh, part of Trivial Pursuit or something of that sort. And uh, anybody who wants to drop ping pong balls on me for the next 20 years, feel free to do so. I'm happy <laughs> to be the recipient. My recall is that an important part of your program, one that uh, people have associated over the years with it, uh, is, was the magic drawing board, and that the magic words were please and thank you. We thank you, sir, for coming and sharing, and please keep up the good work. Thank you.
I'll just add a footnote. It's obvious I raised you very well. Thank you. <laughs>